very um, important guest, and um, his story is, oh my God, we just, it just was so sad. I, th th them, that's the only term that I can actually use today, that it was actually a sad situation. But I want to actually introduce my guest today, Mr. Percy Coleman. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, I, I had um, a very interesting show, so I thought I'd bring it up again uh, today. And then having you on today, I mean, it's just almost just about in that same circle as far as violence here in Chicago. Don't you agree? Well, <laughs> absolutely. And one of the things that uh, this tragic event in, in our life, my life, my wife, my family's life, losing our son, exactly. 38 years old, never been in trouble, never had any problems, just finished getting his master's degree from Illinois University. He got his bachelor's at Chicago University. And he's been to Africa trying to promote hospice. And then he came back here to do things to help the African-American community. He was very much into what we did with each other and the love we do and do not show each other. So it's a, it's a tragedy all around. But the way he lost his life. Yes, and, and um, to my viewers, because I, excuse me, I didn't get a chance to really get into it. But this is the father of Philip Coleman that was tasered by the police and lost his life. And I, I want to welcome you again, and excuse me, I'm so busy thinking about the violence here in Chicago, you know? So let's, let's talk, I want to talk a little bit about what actually happened. Well, the event started December 12th. Mm -hmm. I was just getting off work. I'm a parole supervisor for the state of Illinois. I was just getting off work, and I made it to my neighborhood block. Mm -hmm. And as I was pulling to my normal course, just coming down my street to go to my house, it was blocked off by an ambulance and a police squad car. And at first, I, just, I didn't think much about it because I figured one of my neighbors was having some kind of an event at their home. And I went through the alley to get to my home. As I went through the alley, it's a long turnaround block, mm -hmm. and I came up the other side to come up to the front of my house, and as I was going through the alley, I heard somebody hollering and shouting, and I couldn't make out what they were saying, and I drove past a figure that was hovering over a garbage can, mm -hmm. and then I thought, well, maybe somebody's in trouble, so I stopped. I got out the car, and as I got out the car and looked back, I could recognize that the guy hollering at me was my son, my son Philip. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of confused as to what the heck was he doing out there. And I immediately got up to him and I saw he didn't have on a coat, he was real cold at night. And I, I was saying, Philip, what are you doing, doing out here? And before I could say that, he grabbed me, hugged me, and he kissed me. And then I pushed him off sort of and said, Philip, what are you doing out here? What is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And then he started saying, you're not my dad. Who are you? What are you doing here? What are y'all trying to do to me? And now I'm more confused at his reaction. And before I could say another word to him, he had pushed me back on the car, brushed past me, and he was talking about binding the devil and God, and he was talking about sex. He was all over the place. Mm -hmm. Then I knew something was wrong. I knew something seriously was wrong. And as I was getting back to my car, because I had gotten out the car, mm -hmm. and as I was going back to the car, he kicked at the car and shot at the window. Then I got this cold feeling. I knew something was definitely wrong. So I drove down to where the ambulance was and I asked the ambulance driver, could he help me get my son to a hospital? Because I think he's losing his mind. Mm -hmm. The ambulance driver told me, sir, I can't move this ambulance because I'm here for the lady in that house. Well, that's my friend's house on the end of the corner. 
And I had no idea that the lady he was talking about was my wife. Oh, my goodness. So I said, where are the police? He said, they're in the house. So I went toward the, the house to see the police. As I got to the front door, the police came out. And I said, I need some help. My son is down the street. I think he done lost his mind. And the police said, is his name Philip? I said, yeah, but it never dawned on me. Why are they asking me, mm -hmm. is his name Philip, and they haven't even met him? So we, I proceed with two officers, a, a female and a male, black officers, back toward my house. And as I'm coming toward my house, Philip pops back up out the dark. And he, as they were going towards the, Philip, he put his arms out straight and he made an airplane sound and he came running at us and went straight through us. He didn't touch nobody and just made that air, mm -hmm. uh, airplane sound. And then he just stood up and said, I guess y'all going to taser me now. And the black female officer said, we don't have tasers, we have guns. So they put their weapons out. And they said, get down on the ground, do this, do that. And I jumped in front of him and put my hands up in front of the officer and I said, you're not going to shoot him. Right. They said, if you don't follow our orders, that's exactly what... I said, wait, how are you going to tell somebody that's out of their mind to follow your orders? You're not going to shoot him. My neighbor came out and, and started talking to my son while I was standing in front of the officers. And he said, Philip, I know you, man. I've been knowing you all my life. Mm -hmm. So get down on your knees like they're telling you before these people shoot you. And when I turned around, my neighbor had talked him down to one knee. When I saw him on one knee, I rushed back, grabbed him around his waist, and put him on the ground, told my neighbor to sit on his legs, and begged the police to put their guns up and put the cuffs on him. Mm -hmm. It took them like they had to decide whether that was the right thing to do. Now, he was not fighting me. He was not kicking. He was not doing none of that. He was turning his head to the side, and then I could see his mouth was bleeding bad. So he was spitting like to the side, he was just just like that. Mm -hmm. The officer, the female officer, was standing up over him. I'm kneeling with Philip. I got my arms around him, I got a leg on him, and I got his jaw pressed toward the, the sidewalk. But I let him move his head because he was spitting up blood. She jumps up, pull her gun back out, and said, I don't play this shit. I said, man, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. She told her partner, he's trying to spit on us. I said, man, I'm right here in his face, and he ain't spitting at me. He ain't trying to spit at you. He's clearing his mouth. His mouth is bleeding bad. I said, why don't you all cuff him, and let's put him in the car. We're not going to put him in our car. We'll wait for the squadron. So I kept my son, me and my neighbor. They put so, the, so the police was actually there originally for your wife? Yes. My okay. wife had had the neighbors call the police because my son evidently had attacked her in the house. Okay. Now, while I'm on my knee, I look at my front door, mm -hmm. and it never dawned on me before that the door was open. And nobody ever came out. I, you know, like with all the people coming around, my wife would have come out. Mm -hmm. And then my neighbor was sitting on my son's legs told me, your wife is down there. I said, what is she doing down there? He said, Mr. Coleman, you don't know Philip jumped on her. I said, jumped on her? So you knew something was really wrong oh, at that point. Oh, my goodness. And then right. just to show you how God is, <laughs> when you can't see nothing else, all I could say was, oh, my God, because I knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And by the time the other squadron or whatever it is going to put in the big truck they brought to pick him up, they stood him up, and we started walking him towards the, the van. Okay. Uh, we've had some other problems with white policemen in uh, places like Riverdale. Mm -hmm. And uh, Philip was there to see them. The Riverdale police abused me one night. And he knows about the racism in police departments and some other stuff. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me like when he got back in his right mind, when he got close to that squadron, he turned and looked at me and he said, Dad, Dad, I'm not going in there. You know how they are. You know how they are. And then down to me what he was talking about. Okay. But I was so upset about what might be wrong with my wife. I said, Philip. They had then put cuffs. They had uh, put shackles on his legs and had cuffs on his hand. 
So at this point, you still don't know what's going on. I you still haven't no got idea. to my wife yet. Okay. And as he got to the step, he said, I'm not going in there. And he put his leg up, trying to put his leg up to keep him going up. Mm -hmm. And I, I cursed. I said, Philip, get your butt mm -hmm. on this car because I need to go see what you did to your mother. Mm -hmm. And then he sort of went limp. And we got up on the first step, and then they just pushed him in. I, I was okay with that. Mm -hmm. I turned to the officer, the, the white supervisor mm -hmm. and I said my son needs to go to the hospital because he needs something's wrong with him he, he needs a, some kind of help he said we don't do hospitals we do jail your, your son spit on two of my offices so so, so I, I had had he actually had any type of of problems prior Never. or Never. Had um, anyone been around to? I mean, I'm I'm still trying to figure out what actually might have ticked him off to. I mean, because you sounding like this is actually something um, new. Something you didn't. You this was just some out of the definitely out of the ordinary. It was way out of the ordinary, and mm -hmm. a lot of the neighbors, myself having some law enforcement background. I didn't expect uh, no police courtesy, but I did expect the police to be sensitive to the fact that if somebody lays out in the, in the middle of the sidewalk like my son did and kicking his legs and hollering about binding the devil and, and God and all mm -hmm. this stuff. So I know to, you were just so confused. You didn't have to have no rocket crazy. science to, to background to know that something was wrong with him. Right. But for the police not to follow protocol they have general orders that tell them certain things that they have to do, and mm -hmm. I know something about that. When someone is injured, bleeding, you don't take them to the lockup because the lockup don't want to have responsibility for right. it. You take them to the hospital. This man said they don't do hospitals, they do mm -hmm. jail, and that's exactly where they took my son. And the last time I saw him alive, they took him to 111th Street. Okay, so, so let me back up now because I want to go back to your wife at this point. Now, they didn't put him in a police car, mm -hmm. so you go back to see what happened. So did your wife explain? I went down to my wife, mm -hmm. and when I went in the house, she's a fair-skinned light lady. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you could see the bruises, and she's crying. And the first word she say to me, did I hurt Philip? That's what she said to me. Mm -hmm. I said, no. I said, uh, Philip is in the car, but the neighbors were telling me she didn't want to get in the ambulance until she found out what was going on with her son. And then I, I said, uh, she didn't have on nothing but a night clothes. So mm -hmm. that means she'd come out the house like that. And I told her I would go get her a coat and some shoes because she only had on house shoes. Mm -hmm. And it was a cold night. And that I assured her that Philip was getting ready to go to the hospital and we we're going to take her to the hospital because she wouldn't go until she was wrong with her son. So now she's ready to go to the hospital. I go out to the ambulance that was supposed to be waiting on my wife. The two cops are sitting in the ambulance. They finna take them to the hospital. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I thought you told me you were here to take the woman in the house. Yeah, but the police have been injured. I got to take them to the hospital. The two that was supposed to have been... Spit on. So now my wife is sitting in the house, bruised and bleeding, and they finna take... She got to wait on another ambulance so that they can take these two cops. But did you see something happen other than you all actually holding your son down? No. Was there any type of physical... No physical contact with the police... Because when you went to see your see about your wife, he was in the van. He was in the squadron, and he was shackled with his legs and his hands. The only thing he can do in one of them wagons is, is run and rave and kick and stuff, but he can't do nothing, and he can't hurt nobody. He's no threat to anybody. So there was a problem also. What threat could he have been to them with both his legs and his, both his hands and both his legs shackled? So... We finally get my wife to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I go to two rooms. She's on a gurney, and right next door, they're treating the police for their injuries. I didn't see my son spit on anybody. 
That's just what they were saying. But the bottom line is they never took him to the hospital. He's injured too. They didn't take him to the hospital. So after my wife gets settled at the hospital, they took her to Blue Island. I, she asked, she can't rest. She don't want them doing it to her. She did me did to she ever us. actually tell you what happened? Actually what happened with her and him? She says that uh, he came over to the house that evening because she called him to take some stuff to the mailbox for her. And because we run a business close by, he, he told mm -hmm. him to be over after a little while. So he came over, but she said it was a little different this time. He wanted to talk to her, so they sat down on the couch, and she was talking to him. She's very religious, and he's, he's religious, and they was talking about God and this, that, and the other. And then she said he began to change. He started saying that, who are you? You're not my mother, so-and-so, so-and-so. So she said, well, Philip, I'm going to call your father to come home. And when he told him that, that that's what sent him off. Triggered he he off. never wanted me to know anything that was a problem like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so prior to this happening, had anything been going on with him that you knew of no. or to make him, so you, you had no idea? We what, had no idea. If some, some he had something to drink, if and he was she out had with no somebody? Idea. And she, he sat on that couch, they talked, they prayed, and for like 35, 40 minutes went by, he wasn't exhibiting anything. Then she said he started talking crazy and started acting different. Mm -hmm. And when she got up or tried to get up to say she was going to call me, he started holding her. Mm -hmm. And then when he grabbed her and started holding her, she got nervous. And she pulled away from him, and then a struggle ensued, and whatever mm -hmm. happened, happened. Right. And uh, some kind of way God took care of her. She got into the bathroom, locked the door. Now, she's 69 years old. She opened that window, got out that back, and went down the alley to a neighbor's house. And just being blessed like she is, she asked them to call the police. Well, most of us in our community want to call the police because we think they're supposed to come and help us. Police are always talking about the fact that in our community, nobody ever wants to help them. Well, that night, they had a whole block trying to tell them that that's not the Philip we know. Something is wrong with him. He go to the hospital. They wouldn't take him. So they took him to jail. Now, at this point, you say you made sure that your wife, everything was okay with her, and you knew that the other, the two police officers was at the hospital mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Now, at this point, where do you find out about what's going on with your son? I went over to the 111th Street. I think it's 111th in Ellis, 5th District. Mm -hmm. I went over there thinking I could get some kind of courtesy to see my son, and if he was still running and raving, maybe they would let me see him and talk to him. Did you explain to anyone what had happened on the street, how they had, um, was saying that he had spit on him and, and you saw, you had them held him down? Did you explain any of that to them well, at that point? No, at that point, my only issue was, it was about 1.30 when I left the hospital, went over to the station. And I wanted to see the watch commander. I didn't want to talk to any of the desk people. I wanted to see the watch commander so I could show my credentials, show them who I was, and tell them what went on. Mm -hmm. He comes out. I tell him what was wrong and what happened over there. And I asked him, when were they going to take my son to the hospital? Well, he's calmed down now. He's quiet. I said, but he didn't go to... To the hospital, he's bleeding. But you haven't seen no. him yet. No. I said, well, can I pull out my badge? I showed my badge. I said, well, can I at least go back and talk to him? Let me see him. Well, he's calm now. We don't do that. So I got a little loud, and a detective came over and said, Mr. Coleman, why don't you come upstairs and talk to me? Because I, I need to get some information from you. So I had to go upstairs. He said, I'm going to call the state's attorney out and see if the state's attorney would come over here. Because... I hadn't dawned on me that this could be a domestic and they were going to charge him with the strongest domestic mm -hmm. and I'm saying uh, sergeant this young man is having a mental problem a mental breakdown he needs to be at a hospital and he said off the record we could have handled this differently but I can't overrule a watch commander they're not going to let him go to the hospital 
the best thing you can do is explain to the state's attorney, see what she can charge him with, and we got it, the charges down. So they had all these people telling them that this guy, was something was wrong. Yes, half a block of people was telling the Including police. Including the man's mother saying the same thing. Yes. Your wife, she said the same thing, when and they, they refused. Him, yes, they would not listen to any of us. It was, I want to say, I'd love to say it was all race, but it wasn't just race because there was black police officers out there. And that's the sad part about it. These are folks that grow up around us, live around us, eat around us, mm -hmm. go to church around us, and this is the way they treat people in their own community. So at this point now, he's saying that he couldn't switch, he couldn't make no changes. So what, what, what else was said to you at that point? We, I, I didn't leave that station until almost 3.30 or quarter to four. This sergeant investigator, white investigator, white state's attorney, we talked for about an hour and a half about what happened out there and the fact that nothing has ever happened like this to my son in his en life, entire life. He's never been arrested. They said that they couldn't tell me what they was going to charge him with, but she understood my passion plea, mm -hmm. and she'd take it into consideration. But by all means, they was going to charge him with aggravated battery to a policeman. And see, we have to be concerned about these terms, because aggravated battery means that you physically did something to the police. And what they're saying makes the charge of aggravated battery was that he spit on them. And I told him, I said, he asked me, did I see him spit? I said, he never spit at them. So the neighbor was out there with you all as well, right? Yes. Did the neighbor? One person went to the station with me, but they never questioned her. They never said anything to her. They mm -hmm. only questioned me. Mm -hmm. And then after an hour, two hours, uh, they told me, the sergeant gave me a card, said, you need to be at 26 in California tomorrow at 12 noon sharp so that you can speak for your son, get a bail in, and get him over to a hospital. Okay. I said, okay. That was Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, he's telling me this, 4 o'clock in the morning. I get to the... So they still, they still won't let you see him? Won't let me see him. Okay. And I know he has not left that station since he's been there. We get... To 20, I get to 26 in California the next day. I'm on time. I'm waiting on the call. I look at the, I, go, I rush in the room. I'm sitting down. They call in case after case, and it's getting late, and still there's no Philip Coleman. So I go back and look at the board, and there's only one Coleman on the board. So then I go find someone in charge and say, my son's Philip Coleman is supposed to be here, and you all haven't called his name. The lady came out looked at the board. She said, Mr. Coleman, if his name is not on this board, he's not here. Right. So then I called back out to the police station. I'm trying to get that sergeant that gave me the car. The desk person said, he's not here. He's off the next two days. I said, well, I need to talk to a watch commander. Well, we don't, we, I, I, I'm just on the desk. I can't give you a watch commander. I said, well, to find out why my son, Philip Coleman, who was supposed to be a 26 in California uh, today, is not here. Well, he's still in the back. Uh, they're doing some uh, review of some uh, fingerprints or something on him. So I called my neighbor, a uh, friend of my son, and, and asked him to go over to 111th Street till I got there to find out what was going on with my son. Mm -hmm. They told Mr. Harris uh, that my son was in the back of the police station. They were still running some preliminary investigative things on him. But if he would uh, go to Harrison Street Friday morning, his bail would be set and he would be over to Friday morning at the at the Harrison Street station. Mm -hmm. So he called and told me that. I said, Dennis, don't leave that. They spent me this today having me down at 26 in California. Now they say he's at the station, I'm coming out there to see him. I don't know if I have to get a, a, a lawyer or a politician or somebody, but I'm coming out there to see him. I get out there, it's almost 2.30. Dennis come to the door and meet me. He said, they say he's still back there, but they busy. So I'll go to the desk. I want to talk to the watch commander. This young lady tells me that uh, the watch commander's in a meeting, and I don't know how long it's to be, but you can come back later. I said, I'm not leaving, and I want to see my son, 
and you need to tell the watch commander, either he'll tell me why I can't see my son, or I'll go get somebody in here with authority to come in here, whether it's a politician or a lawyer. But I'm going to, somebody going to see my son today. The white guy comes out, he tells me, what's your name? And look at my credentials, mm -hmm. look at my badge and all this stuff. And he said, well, I said, why wasn't my son at 26 in California? He said, well, the truth is your son was uh, not cooperating today and he was combative. So we couldn't bring him down at 26 in California. Now, this is at 2.30. I said, well, then I want to see my son. Because this cop told me he was in the back. I said, I want to see my son. Well, he'll be at Harrison Street tomorrow. I said, I want to get spent again about where he's going to be. Now, are you in command or not? Uh, well, I'm not the I said, I want to speak to the person in command. 